1964, there was an author named Ruth Harrison who wrote a book describing the intense livestock and poultry farm practices. This at the time caused an uproar in the British Government Establishment Committee. A year later, in 1965, a professor by the name of Francis Bramble presented to the British Government an 85-page report on animal welfare, which became known as the Bramble Report. The five freedoms in the legislation are freedom from hunger and thirst by providing fresh water and a healthy diet, freedom from discomfort by providing an appropriate environment such as shelters and resting areas, freedom from pain, injury and disease by preventing and diagnosing animals instantly, freedom to express their natural behaviour by providing the animal with their own kind and with the adequate space and facilities, and freedom from fear and distress by making sure the conditions and treatment of the animals cause no mental suffering. The five freedoms have been highly influential and are still implemented by prestigious zoos all around the world today, with zoos and zookeepers taking pride in upholding the standards that were set by Francis Bramble. Some of the main governing zoo legislations are the Ballet Directive, the Zoo Legislation Act and the Secretary of State Standards of Modern Zoo Practice. The Ballet Directive was established in 2002 and is an EU Council Directive that governs the transport of non-domestic animals between EU member states. The Zoo Licensing Act was founded in 1981 and this legislation makes it so that the requirement of a license is required to hold exotic animals if they are to be shown to the public. Records are also to be kept of the animals and the welfare of the animals to be of a high standard. Lastly is the SSMZP which was established in 1999 and plays parts in making sure zoos are keeping to the five freedoms and of keeping records of all their animals. <laughs> there are voluntary organisations that aid in governing zoos if the zoos opt to join the collective. Some of these organisations are the British and Irish Associations of Zoos and Aquariums, the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Piazza was founded in 1966 and provides video guidelines and advice on the best practices for zookeeping. The aim of Piazza is to promote conservation and public concern for the natural world. Piazza was founded in 1986 and aids in the planning and coordination of wildlife conservations. It also promotes education and welfare in animals and contributes to international discussions advising the European Union. ASA got established in 1924 and they promote excellence in animal care and welfare, conservation, education and research. The main roles of the keeper are to promote and apply education, conservation and research, feeding and watering, cleaning enclosures, vaccinating, medicating and adding enrichment. The keepers also need to make sure they are checking animal welfare, health care, record keeping and safety checks. When the keepers are taking down the information and getting records of the animals, the main record keeping system they will use is ZIMS, Zoological Information Management System. When recording breeding records, the keepers should be keeping track of the health history of the animals including their relatives, where the family is kept and what zoos they were conceived in to avoid inbreeding. Zookeepers can use a system produced by EASA called the European Stud Book. Capturing these stud books is data of the births, deaths and transfers. A more intensive population management system is the EEEP, which is used in the European zoos and aquariums. Each species is allocated a coordinator and a species committee that collect the data for the species across Europe and produce a stud book to analyse the genetics and decide on the future management for the species. The committee and coordinator then decide which species should be transferred to zoos and breeding programmes. If a zoo was adhering to good welfare standards, then it would not be too unusual to see the zoos displaying or representing their organisation badges, seeing that other animals in good conditions, the enclosures with a high standard of cleanliness and full of enrichment, and another good sign of good welfare is having information boards beside the enclosures. When the zoo show poor welfare standards, it becomes visibly obvious the zoo will have no enrichment in the enclosures, there will be no activity out of the animals, the animals will be in poor condition along with the enclosure, and the zookeepers will be uninformed on the animals they have requirements. Scottish wildcats eat small mammals in the wild, such as rabbit, mice, foal, grey squirrel and birds, alongside whatever other carcasses they could scavenge. When they are in the wild, they feed whenever they can successfully catch a prey. Whilst they are hunting, they will scavenge around for scraps to eat mine miles, such as carcasses left over or roadkill. They obtain their food by hunting and scavenging. The Scottish wildcat's whole day is partly spent hunting for prey or scavenging for carcasses. When feeding the Scottish wildcats in captivity, it is best for the species to feed them as close as possible to the diet they would have in the wilderness. Luckily, the Scottish wildcat diet is native and easily sourced. 
An optimal diet would consist of rabbits and grey squirrels with their occasional mulch to help provide a good rotation of food. In captivity, the food that comes from the World Life Centre is presented to the world cats in two different methods from what I have observed so far in my time studying there. The first method was scattering it around the closure, which is sometimes done due to low staff and having to time crunch. And the second method was to tie the carcass up on a tree and have the world cats claw or bite it down, which is the more optimal way. The food is presented this way as it promotes natural hunting behaviours in the wild guts. You must actively use their nose to track the smell and locate the carcass. And as for tying it up, it promotes natural muscle development and they must stretch up and yank the carcass down in order to eat. The methods used do a good job of mimicking how they would feed in the wild, as it is tapping into using their senses alongside using muscles to pumps and drag pay to the ground. Factors that might lead to the wild cats to show uncharacteristic behaviours are the cats being too close to prey or predators. Interacting too much with humans, poor dietary conditions, poor health and lack of enclosed enrichment, and space alongside introducing new members. Factors that could lead to the Shetland Pony showing uncorrected behaviours are being too close to predators, human interaction such as grooming and hand feeding, being isolated by itself can cause depression and lack of space or having a poor diet will also lead to behavioural problems. Hand reading an animal should be avoided where possible, as it promotes a lot of unhealthy interaction with the animals and humans. The problems of hand reading can manifest in animals relying too heavily on humans being present to feed and are dependent on humans for attention. This can be seen through food anticipation, which in turn will develop poor or lack of hunting skills and the animal will be likely outcasted due to lack of species socialisation. When in captivity, it is not uncommon for uncharacteristic behaviours to develop. In the Scottish Wildcat, for example, the manifestations could show in the forms of pacing in the closure and back and forth trying to elicit human attention, pre-feeding. When stressed, we can see over-grooming happening alongside chewing, whether that be themselves or objects under cosler. What may also occur is the cat being an outcast. To stop these behaviours from occurring, the keepers can try implementing different tactics. Some of these involve isolating or minimalising human activity, forcing the animal to another, Implementing starve days so that a schedule isn't imprinted onto the animal. Setting up food activities promoting stimuli. Working on the enclosures by adding enrichment and taking care of them medically such as treating infestations, diseases and illnesses that they may have. Ethogram and welfare checks were used to monitor the welfare of the Scottish wildcats. As you can see, the dominant behaviour of the wildcats was mostly resting. The welfare of the Scottish wildcats is very good as you can see from the data. They have veterinary care available to them and access to daily food which is sometimes strung up and fresh water which they get from a bowl. It would be more beneficial if there were feeding toys that could implement more natural feeding behaviours available to them. They have safe hiding spaces available to them to be able to escape human gaze and the closer itself is spacious which allows for activities. The enclosure also has got a good amount of enrichment such as trees and bushes which mimics their natural environment very well. For our enrichment, we decided to go for a feeding box. Our goal with this was to present the wild cats with a new way to get food while making them work for it. By adding another feeding method, we hope to see more activity out of the Scottish wild cats. <laughs>
Thank you for watching my documentary.